So I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, diagnosis and treatment of epilepsy and uh, talk a, bit, a little bit about what's new. And someone, you may ask, well, maybe that's not working. There we go. So actually, there's something new in defining what is epilepsy. Now, we used to think epilepsy was having, or was defined as two or more seizures, uh, and that would lead to the diagnosis of epilepsy. However, within the past year, there's been a new definition of, of uh, epilepsy that was uh, put out. Um, and the definition still includes having two or more seizures, but the second component of that definition is if you have one seizure and there is an indication of an increased risk for other seizures, and that could include an EEG that is abnormal, an MRI that is abnormal, or other risk factors uh, for the development of, of epilepsy. And in reality, when we would see somebody who presented with the very first seizure and had an abnormal EEG, we would actually treat those individuals because we felt their risk of having another seizure was quite high. And so it really didn't change how we managed epilepsy necessarily, but it did change how we define it. So that's a, a relatively new definition that's uh, been out there and, and pretty much uh, accepted within the, in the medical community. Uh, so we really don't necessarily want to wait for that second seizure to treat in somebody. If we can prevent that second seizure from occurring, then that's um, an ideal situation. And over the years, there's been a number of terms for epilepsy, uh, including seizure disorder, and they're really the same, same thing. One thing to remember is that epilepsy is really a term that indicates that someone is at risk for more seizures. It doesn't tell us the cause of the epilepsy, and it doesn't tell us anything about the prognosis or how that individual will do. And in, in reality, there are many different types of epilepsies um, uh, and, and different epilepsy syndromes. So uh, one individual with epilepsy may have a distinctly different seizure type and different uh, out, outlook and outcome than someone else with epilepsy. So there's many, many different types of epilepsies. Uh, and that makes it a little frustrating because each individual has different types of seizures, different types of response to medication. When we see somebody with epilepsy, we try to make a distinction of, of uh, determining if an ind individual has one of two types of epilepsies. One is focal epilepsy, and that's a seizure that occurs when there's seizures arising in one region of the brain or one part of the brain or one focus of the brain. And then the second category is generalized onset epilepsy, and that's where the seizures don't arise focally in one part of the brain. We try to make that distinction because it does uh, help us determine what medications to use. There are certain medicines that are not effective for generalized epilepsies uh, where there may be others that are. And so we try to make that distinction. Now when you look at, at who has epilepsy, it's a very, very common neurologic condition. Uh, up to three million of Americans in this country have epilepsy, and that number may actually be higher if we use the new definition. Um, there's up to 130,000 new in individuals in this country treated or diagnosed with epilepsy for the first time, and it does affect all age groups. Uh, when I see an adult with new onset seizures, um, one of the questions that comes up is, I thought epilepsy only started in children. And um, while children have a higher incidence, incidence is when the epilepsy first uh, makes its appearance, there is a peak in ch childhood, as you can see on the left-hand side um, over here. But as individuals get older, there is a higher incidence or higher frequency of new onset seizures in the elderly population. But this risk never really goes to zero. So there's always a chance that someone will have a seizure for the first time at really any age, um, uh, at any age. When we look at what causes epilepsy, the vast majority of the time we don't know the cause. Even with the tools we have now in 2015 with advanced MRI um, and other, uh, other um, uh, genetic, uh, genetic tests, we don't really understand the cause of epilepsy in about two out of three individuals. Um, generally, those individuals that have an unknown cause may actually respond a little bit better to treatment, uh, which is, is potentially a, a, uh, one of the positives of not knowing what the cause of the epilepsy is. There are some known causes of epilepsy, including vascular causes, for example, a prior stroke can be a, a risk factor for seizures, um, a blood vessel abnormality in the brain. There are other things like brain tumors, um, head trauma, uh, all are known causes of epilepsy, but those actually make up the the, 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 the smaller number of, of patients that we see. The most, you know, two out of three individuals have an unknown cause for their epilepsy. That doesn't mean we don't look. We always, when we see somebody for 
new onset epilepsy, we evaluate and try to understand the underlying cause of their epilepsy. So how do we diagnose epilepsy? Well, unfortunately, there's not one single, single diagnostic test. It's not like um, diagnosing strep throat where you do a throat culture or a throat swab and determine if there's strep, streptococcal uh, bacteria causing the, the uh, uh, infection. We don't have that for epilepsy. We don't have a single test that's going to tell us that, yes, somebody has epilepsy or no, someone does not has, have epilepsy. And actually, one of the best tools we have is actually sitting down and talking to the individual uh, and the family uh, about what happens during an individual's seizures. That really is actually one of the best tools we have. And uh, even with, again, advanced techniques we have, uh, nothing really replaces getting a good history from the individual about what happens during the seizure and from witnesses as well, if possible. We do a neurologic exam. Sometimes that helps. But we're also doing additional testing, diagnostic testing. And those include an EEG and an MRI uh, in, in most individuals. And then there's advanced techniques, which we'll talk about in a bit, ambulatory EEG and inpatient video EEG monitoring. So the EEG we are doing to look for what we call epileptiform abnormalities. And these are very brief electrical abnormalities that occur uh, uh, on the EEG that are in that suggests that there's a part of the brain or parts of the brain that are electrically irritable and potentially prone to producing seizures. We don't see them in every case, and sometimes that's challenging. So if we do a, a somebody uh, an EEG on someone with, with new onset seizures and that EEG is normal, it doesn't rule out epilepsy. So a single routine EEG doesn't rule it out. We may do repeat testing um, with uh, sleep deprivation or sometimes ambulatory EEG where we record for a longer period of time to look for those abnormalities. And it does help us. We, we are looking for two, sort of two big things. One, are, are we seeing focal spikes? Are we seeing these epileptiform discharges arising over one region of the brain, for example, the right temporal lobe? Or are we seeing generalized spike wave? And that helps, make us, helps us make that distinction between <laughs> focal seizures and generalized seizures, and ultimately helps us determine treatment. We also do MRI in, in most cases, and we're looking for an underlying structural lesion, an underlying spot in the brain that might be a cause for the seizure. So we can, we can see people with tumors, um, vascular lesions, blood vessel abnormalities. We can see developmental abnormalities. We may look for scar tissue, uh, sort of a, a generic term indicating that there's some evidence of, of something that's happened to the brain at some point in time. But most of the time, actually, the MRI is normal. So again, like a normal EEG, a normal MRI does not rule out epilepsy. So you can have someone, someone may have epilepsy and their EEG may be normal and their MRI may be normal. That does not mean they do not have epilepsy. So epilepsy is really defined because they've had more than one seizure. Another tool that, that is available is called video EEG monitoring, where the idea will be to capture seizures during EEG testing. So generally, this involves admission to the hospital uh, uh, where uh, you're, an individual is hooked up to EEG. The EEG is recorded continuously over the course of several days. And then um, we video. We have video going as well. And the goal is really to capture seizures and determine what type of seizure someone has and determine how do we treat it, what do we, what do, we do to treat, best treat the seizure. It's typically done in individuals that have seizures that are not under good control. So if someone's been on several medicines and is not seizure-free, this is something that we do to, to better assess uh, the seizures. We also do this when we're evaluating someone for epilepsy surgery to figure out and pinpoint the part of the brain where the seizures come from. And we'll talk a little bit about that in, in a few moments. So those are the tools we use on uh, how we diagnose epilepsy. Again, the most important tool is actually getting a history from the individual about what happens during the seizures. We're going to talk next about treatment of epilepsy um, and start with medications. So seizure medications are all, many different terms, anti-epileptic drugs or AEDs, uh, anti-convulsants, anti-seizure medicines, they're all the same thing. And the vast majority of epilepsy we treat with medications. Um, the, really the biggest challenge that we have is trying to figure out what medicine is best for that individual. And I'll show you why that's a challenge in a moment. Um, so uh, I have, I treat many people with epilepsy. I can't, I can probably tell you that I don't have uh, people, the same person on the exact same medicine from individual to individual. It's, it's quite varied from individual to individual. And, and a medicine that works well for one person may not work for another. 
And this is why it's challenging. We have 22 different seizure medicines now that we can use. Um, and it, it, it's great that we have so many options, but it also makes it really challenging to figure out when I'm seeing an individual in the office, we're treating for the first time for seizures, which one of these medicines do I use? And it, it, it's challenging. We've got these, um, I've got these divided up into old, newer, and newest. From the late 70s until the early 1990s, we had no new seizure medicines available. And then starting in the mid-1990s, we had a lot of seizure medicines available, and then none for a few years, and then a whole host of medicines available as well in the past uh, 10 years as well. Um, again, it, 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 it's great that we have so many options, but it also adds a challenge about really deciding how to, how to best treat an individual. And I'm not going to really talk about specific medications today. Um, to do that would probably take about two hours. Um, so we're not going to do that. Um, now, some of these medicines on the list are, are indicated for certain seizure types and not others. Um, other medications work well for many different seizure types. So how do we approach somebody with, with epilepsy and how do we decide how to treat, treat them? Well, um, we like to think we do it scientifically, but to be honest with you, it's trial and error method. Um, this is where some of there's, there's the art of medicine comes into play. Um, we have some guidelines out there to help us at least make some initial treatment decisions, but they're not perfect. Um, when you see the list of medicines, it's really hard to make a single guideline to say you should use medicine A, B, and C in that order. Uh, our treatment goal, no matter whatever treatment we're offering, is uh, seizure freedom and no side effects. So when I see somebody for the first time with, with epilepsy, I'm going to at least work. First, I try to figure out do they have focal epilepsy or generalized epilepsy. And once I, I determine that, then I can use medicines that will work or are, no, or, or are known to work for that particular epilepsy syndrome. I'll use one drug, and I'll use it in what we call monotherapy, meaning by itself. And I'm going to pick a target dose that I think is uh, potentially effective based on studies, and then uh, continue on that dose. And uh, if I have blood levels available, I'll check blood levels. And I'll work on <coughs> excuse me, trying to find a dose of that medicine that's going to work to control seizures and not produce side effects. If that doesn't work, then I'm going to switch to a different drug uh, and try to do that in monotherapy. If that's, and I go through that same process. If that second drug is not working, then I'll, I'll either change them to a third drug or try two drugs in, in together. And if I'm not successful after two or three drugs, then I'm going to consider bringing that patient into the monitoring unit to figure out what are we doing, what, what can we do better. So there is a, <clears throat> excuse me, again, a trial and error effect, although we like to think we do it scientifically. So how does that how does that method work? Well, this is a study from about uh, 15 years ago now where they took individuals with new onset seizures and treated them, and then they, they really looked at the outcome. So when we look at this, um, they went through this sequence, first drug, monotherapy, second drug, third drug, and trying more than one drug in combination. So if you look at the outcome after the first drug, uh, about half of the patients became seizure-free with that first drug. It didn't really matter what drug was given. So you, with the first drug, you get about 50%. About half of your patients are seizure-free and, and doing well. If you take that, that group <coughs> that is not controlled, that, that half of those that are not controlled, and then switch them to a second drug, you only get about 13% seizure-free, or one in seven become seizure-free. If you then try those individuals that are not controlled on a third drug, you get about 1% seizure-free. So you can see that the success when uh, each drug fails of being seizure-free is, is declines each time. And that's, that's frustrating, um, but tells us that this is where we come up with that two or three drug failure um, plan to look at other options if, if medications are not working. And then if you try two drugs in combination, you get about one in 33 seizure-free. So it's not, again, that first drug and second drug response is predictive of, of future response. So that leads us into the, 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 the definition of refractory epilepsy or medication-resistant epilepsy or drug-resistant epilepsy. They all are, are used together. Uh, about four years ago, a, a group of uh, experts from around the world came together to look at studies and trying to define, come up with a definition of what was drug-resistant epilepsy. The previous couple of slides I showed you, there's 22 medicines, and that's, 
Uh, when you really look at practicality, if you're going to try all 22 medicines, it's going to take probably 50 years to get through those different medicines. So we really don't want to make a definition of drug-resistant epilepsy of failing all seizure medicines. So based on the previous study of looking at uh, how did people do with new onset seizures, this group of experts decided that if someone was not controlled with two appropriately chosen seizure medicines for their particular epilepsy syndrome, then that was defined as drug-resistant epilepsy. Um, and this was the first time we really had a, a, an accepted definition of, of drug-resistant epilepsy. Uh, and previous to this, there were a lot of different potential definitions. And so I think this is a helpful tool, tool when we see people in the office um, with determining are they responding, are they doing well, or are they not doing well. And then the authors in this group felt, in this paper felt that if someone met that definition of drug-resistant epilepsy, then they should be seen at an epilepsy center to assess uh, potential other treatments for their uh, refractory epilepsy. So to summarize sort of medications, the good news is, is that when you look at the numbers, um, about two out of three individuals have well-controlled seizures. The bad news is, is that that's one in three that don't have well-controlled seizures. And those individuals that don't have well-controlled seizures may be potential candidates for other options. And those include epilepsy surgery, uh, stimulation devices, uh, investigational medications, uh, there's dietary therapy, and then other things that we can do is, are managed triggers. The things that I will talk about is epilepsy surgery and stimulation devices. Dr. Privatera will talk about stress uh, management as a potential uh, treatment for epilepsy in the managing trigger section. We're not going to talk about the diet today because um, for most adults it's, it's uh, a challenging uh, approach. So let's talk about epilepsy surgery. Unfortunately, when you look at the, at the numbers uh, across the country, um, that epilepsy surgery actually is an underutilized treatment option for epilepsy. And one of the authors, uh, Pete Engel, who's at UCLA, has set, said in public forums that it's one of the, the uh, least underutilized or most underutilized uh, effective treatment, medical treatments in, the, in all of medicine. I'm not sure if that's true, but uh, we do see when we look at the numbers that uh, if you take all individuals with medication-resistant epilepsy, very few of them are actually referred to epilepsy centers for consideration of other uh, treatments. It's hard to determine exactly how many people are candidates for surgery, just sort of in a population method, but um, there's about 100,000 to 200,000 patients that may be candidates for surgery, but over the year, each year there's only about 2,000 to 3,000 surgical procedures performed annually, so you can see the numbers are distinctly different. And unfortunately, we will see people who have had uh, medication-resistant epilepsy for many, many years um, prior to them being evaluated in an epilepsy center. And when you have seizures for a long period of time, that can clearly impact how an individual does. Um, if you look at, at the data, it's uh, roughly about 18 to 20 years before an individual is referred to an epilepsy center for consideration of other treatment options. And that's not only locally, but nationally. Uh, it's, it's, a pro it's a national problem. A couple things that, that and I've been doing uh, epilepsy for um, 18 years, 18 years. Um, a couple things that I've observed and, and, and matches what uh, other individuals across the country that I've spoken to is that we don't see patients in a timely manner in the epilepsy center. And epilepsy surgery is perceived as a last resort, a drastic option for treatment of epilepsy, um, both by uh, referring providers and also uh, potentially patients and families. And I think a couple of things lead to that. One is that when we look at medication-resistant epilepsy, there are, there are risks associated with that, and I think those risks are potentially underestimated. The outcome of medical therapy is overestimated. So if someone's tried five drugs, um, trying a sixth drug, uh, the, the thought is that, well, that's going to be the miracle cure, and it, unfortunately the, suggest, the data suggests that that's not the case. And then the risks of surgery are potentially overestimated. Depending on the type of surgery that we're, that we're doing, uh, some, some of the, these are very low-risk procedures. Again, it's different than taking a medicine, but um, certain um, epilepsy surgery procedures are, are pretty safe. Um, in particular, we're talking about temporal lobectomy here that, that um, somebody who's young and healthy actually can recover quite well from. 
This is from a paper, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but this was um, a discussion about common misperceptions about epilepsy surgery, including things like all drugs need to be tried, um, a normal MRI is, is a contraindication or something that keeps someone from having surgery, um, other things here, and, and on the right-hand side is sort of the, 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 the argument against those. And I use this when I talk to our uh, residents about uh, uh, management of epilepsy. So uh, sort of the bottom line is when we look at epilepsy surgery, it's a potential effective treatment option for individuals. There is a, a uh, RCT is randomized controlled trial, uh, really which is the way to study uh, treatment options is to do a randomized controlled trial. Show that temporal lobe surgery was uh, superior to medical therapy in individuals with medication-resistant epilepsy. We have um, guidelines out there by our Academy of Neurology indicating that individuals with medication-resistant epilepsy should be evaluated for surgery. Uh, and those, those guidelines have been out for 10 years now, 15 years. Uh, and interestingly, um, a group looked at referral patterns after the guidelines were introduced and found that there was no change in referrals to epilepsy centers despite having good evidence and good guidelines out there that epilepsy surgery is effective. So that's unfortunate and uh, um, an unfortunate uh, piece of data that we discovered. So when we look at the outcome of epilepsy surgery, it really depends on the type of seizures and the type of surgery we're doing. The best individuals uh, are those with temporal lobe seizures. So a focal temporal lobe seizure um, offer, uh, have, has the best outcome. And we're measuring outcome here in pure seizure freedom. So if you have an abnormality in the temporal lobe uh, and the seizures come from that area, there's a 70 to 80 percent chance of complete seizure freedom. If we compare that to medications after three, four, or five medications, that's a less than 5 percent chance. So there's a big difference there. Um, again, there's a difference in risk as well. Individuals with seizures that come from outside the temporal lobe, however, um, don't do as well. And those are much more challenging um, because of, of uh, difficult to pinpoint where the seizures are coming from. Um, but it is something that is offered, particularly in somebody that isn't responding to medications. So when do we consider surgery for epilepsy? One is that they have to have medication-resistant seizures. They have to have a seizure, a un, what we call unilateral seizure focus, meaning that that seizure onset has to come from one area and we have to be able to surgically take that out safely. So if, it's, if the seizure focus is coming from an area that controls motor hand movements, of, or hand movements uh, there's a risk of removing that and producing paralysis, we would not offer surgery in that instance. There has to be, generally the patient has to be otherwise healthy, um, and then an MRI identified abnormality does help improve outcome, but it is not required. So really the two major criteria are it has to come from one region of the brain and we have to safely take it out. So those are pretty broad uh, potential criteria for who's a candidate. Now it's a little bit more complicated than that because we do a lot of different tests, um, uh, including video EEG monitoring. So the idea would be to pinpoint where seizures are coming from. We'll do a, an MRI if we don't have good pictures uh, or a recent MRI to look for subtle abnormalities in the brain that might be a seizure focus. Individuals undergo detailed neuropsychological testing. Dr. Shear will be talking later about neuropsychology and memory and epilepsy. Um, she will and her team uh, torture our patients for about six hours uh, doing a number of tests to try to figure out are there focal memory abnormalities that might actually help us localize where seizures come from and also help us determine what is the risk of, of memory after surgery. We'll do a PET scan to look for metabolism. I'll show you a picture in a moment. And then some individuals might have other tests, including ectal spec, I'll show you a picture of that, and then uh, additional tests of memory function, including with, with uh, WADA testing. So this is a PET scan. Uh, a PET scan is where there is a uh, intravenous injection of a radioactive glucose that basically shows the parts of the brain that are metabolizing glucose. And what we are looking for are, is an area of reduced metabolism. And this is the area of reduced metabolism here. This blue area is reduced, and that happens to be in the right temporal lobe. So based on this scan alone, we would predict that the, this patient has right temporal seizures. This is an ictal spec. This is actually what's called a syscom. So this is a, a test that's a little bit more challenging where you inject another type of radioactive into the vein during a seizure. So we have a, a nuclear medicine technician sits at bedside in the monitoring unit waiting for a seizure will inject uh, an isotope, and then we ultimately scan the patient 
uh, later. And this patient has a focus here, this orange area, in the left temporal lobe. So this helps us further pinpoint where seizures are coming from. So after we get all of our tests, then what happens? Well, we actually sit down as a team. We have six uh, epileptologists that sit down. We have our nurse psychologist. We have our nurse surgeon. We have our, our team that sits down and reviews the seizures on EEG, the imaging, um, the, the memory testing results, and we come to a consensus. So we, we decide, do we have enough information available to, um, to, to offer surgery? And if so, what type of surgery would we offer? What, and then we come up with a determination of what we think the outcome is. If we have information that's conflicting, then we talk about additional testing that might be needed. And I tell my patients sometimes that this is like a free second opinion. So it's not just me telling you that, that yeah, you need surgery. It's, it's my team. It's a whole group of individuals saying that this is an option. So it's, it's kind of cool. We sit down and we have great discussions uh, twice a month where we review a number of cases uh, and talk about what are the treatment options. Additional tools that we may do when we're evaluating someone for epilepsy surgery includes phase two monitoring. Many times we can offer surgery if the scalp EEG, EEG from just recorded on the skull, um, is enough. But sometimes we, we're not sure. If we have conflicting information, we might do phase two monitoring where we implant, surgically implant electrodes over the, over the brain. And we do that for a number of reasons, primarily to better pinpoint where the seizures are coming from. And this is just an example of somebody with a group of uh, electrodes here. This is what's called a grid. There's 64 electrodes here that are placed over the surface of the brain. And then we, we record seizures like we do with regular seizure monitoring and determine which electrodes produce the seizure onset. And then we can do mapping where we figure out, is the seizure focused near potentially important areas like motor control or speech or language? We, fortunately, we don't have to do this in everyone. This does have a higher risk associated with it, um, uh, but is needed if we can't exactly determine or pinpoint where the seizures are coming from. Now, some individuals may not be candidates for surgery because they're coming from more than one spot or we can't pinpoint where they're coming from. And those individuals may be candidates for other treatments which uh, fall into the category of stimulation devices. So the vagus nerve stimulator is a device that's been available for 1997 or 1998, quite many years. And then a newer device called responsive neurostimulation is, was recently approved as well. There are some other stimulation devices in, in trials but are not yet approved, including deep brain stimulation. So the vagus nerve stimulator is a device that does not require brain surgery. There is a um, generator here placed in the chest and a wire that's wrapped around the vagus nerve on the left. And we program the device using a little handheld computer to stimulate that nerve. So it's typically stimulated, so it stimulates for 30 seconds, it's off for five minutes, back on for 30 seconds, off for five minutes. And that stimulation, that intermittent stimulation, may reduce seizure frequency. And the other uh, uh, added uh, uh, thing with this is that there's a magnet you can swipe over the device if an individual gets a warning of a seizure or uh, a family member sees a seizure, and that may actually shorten a seizure or stop a seizure. Overall, the study results suggest that the VNS results in a 25 to 30 percent reduction in seizures over time. It's not a cure for seizures, um, and the seizure freedom is much different than epilepsy surgery. So most centers will offer VNS in individuals that are not candidates for surgery or have not responded to surgery, uh, given the fact that it's less effective than um, uh, temporal lobectomy, for example. It does have a different side effect profile and different uh, uh, than seizure medication. So its side effects are related to when the stimulator is on. There may be a voice change or cough or discomfort. When the stimulator is off, there's really no, no adverse effects. And then the responsive neurostimulator is an interesting uh, device that uh, does require brain surgery to put in. This is a schematic of a guy who has this. This is the device here. And you can see that there's some um, electrodes implanted as well. So this actually is a mini EEG machine that's plant implanted, but it's also a stimulator. So it's programmed to, uh, you program it to detect seizures, and when there's a seizure detected on EEG, it will electrically stimulate uh, uh, the cortex, the brain. And the idea is that that will prevent a seizure from occurring. And it only stimulates when you, it's uh, detecting seizures. So that's the term responsive. So it only stimulates when it detects electrical seizures. <coughs> 
Um, overall, the outcome is in the same group as, as VNS, about a 30 to 40 percent seizure reduction. This is a situation where we might consider doing this in somebody who has seizures coming from two spots. And you can put electrodes over different regions of the brain and program them differently. Or if the seizure focus is too close to important areas like motor areas or speech areas. Or if somebody has not responded to epilepsy surgery and we need additional treatments. Um, many patients will need implanted electrodes to further pinpoint the seizures. So you, the, the challenge with this medicine is you need to know where the seizures are coming from before you can Im implant that. Unlike the VNS, if you don't know where the seizures are coming from, that's a potential option. We're, this was approved about two years ago. We're still trying to understand what, what its role is, um, but sort of the clinical scenarios listed there are kind of where we think uh, it may be offered. Now, what's coming? Uh, there's some interesting things coming out, uh, hopefully within the next year or two years. One are improved management uh, techniques for seizure clusters. So, uh, or prolonged seizures. So currently we really have two options. One is a diastat or rectal diazepam, uh, which is not the best route of administration, and basically pills to take uh, for seizure clusters, lorazepam. There's a couple of companies studying nasal sprays of lorazepam or midazolam, so the idea would be you would, would spray this in the nose if there's a seizure cluster. Um, and then there's some sort of self-injectable pens that are being studied as well. There are more medications being studied, including cannabidiols, and Dr. Pivotero will talk about that in a minute. And then deep brain stimulation is also being studied as well, and hopefully we'll have some um, answers whether that will be effective down the road. A couple things to, to, to sort of end with. One is, what can you do to help with seizure control? Um, certainly taking medications as, pre as prescribed is very important. Missed medications is a potential seizure trigger. I, I always like to have my patients track their seizures and, and bring, them, bring a calendar with, the, with them to the office um, so we can understand uh, trends in seizure control and what are, what are the responses to medications. It can be a, I, have, I have people that, that do different things. There are apps on smartphones that you can use to track seizures, um, and I have some individuals that will track that and actually send me uh, an email message in the EMR with a link to their seizure calendar right ahead of the appointment. I have people that just use little notebooks or uh, pocket calendars. It doesn't matter what you use, just uh, whatever you feel comfortable with, but tracking seizures is very, very important. Um, you should discuss with your provider a seizure plan. What should you do, what to do if there are seizures, and at what point in time should you go to the emergency room? And then managing triggers best you can. Uh, stress is not always easy to manage. We'll, we'll hear about that in a moment. Avoiding sleep deprivation, excessive alcohol use, and other sort of stimulant drugs are, are things that, we, that, that one can do. So we'll conclude here. We know that epilepsy is common. Um, fortunately, two out of three individuals do well. Unfortunately, one out of three individuals do not do well and have medication-resistant epilepsy. No matter what treatment we offer, uh, our treatment goal is seizure freedom uh, with minimal side effects. Each individual has a different treatment plan, and we try to individualize that for each individual. Surgery is an option for some, and we, we always have new treatments on the way that are out there for individuals that aren't responding to current therapy. Thank you.